Uh, I'm going to talk about Azure functions and NuGet packages, which I think equals the superpowers these days. Uh, so my name is Teemu Tapanola. I'm a Microsoft Azure MVP based in Helsinki, uh, Finland these days. Uh, I was three years in Sweden before this. Uh, I work as an architect at Onsite Helsinki, which is a, a training and consulting company, and my special focus on Azure. I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer. I do quite a lot of training for different kind of companies, more developer side. Uh, you can reach me by email uh, with any question, uh, or you can tweet me if you have ever any problems with Azure. I promise to answer. I don't promise that my answer is good or, or like I give you a real answer, but I will promise to answer you something. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about Azure Functions, NuGet packages, and then Azure Functions plus NuGet packages, how they combine. Uh, before we get started, how many have you used Azure Functions? Please raise your hand. How many have you used Logic Apps? How many think Logic Apps is amazing currently? Yeah, I, yeah, I would say that they're not amazing yet. They will be amazing. I would not say that Azure Functions is yet the best product, but I believe they will be. So what's the whole idea between Azure Functions? The whole idea is that you have code. It doesn't matter what kind of code, you have a code. Then you have some kind of event or you have some kind of data that you want to do something. And when you combine them together, you get Azure Functions. Uh, this is one of the things is that I think Microsoft marketing normally does very bad job with naming. I mean, they normally do like the first naming version, amazing, like Azure websites, amazing name. Now they're called Azure App Service Web Apps. Like why? Azure websites was amazing name. Azure Functions is an amazing name. It tells you right away what it does. It's a function that runs on Azure. Nice. Then we have somebody else who's named it as a Lambda. I think Azure Functions is way better. Uh, so what do you do with Azure Functions? You have your code. Now the thing is like, it's not like you're limited to .NET or you're limited to Node or Java. The idea is that whatever you have that's compilable to .x, if it's a bad script, PHP, Node, C Sharp, C++, as long as if you can compile it or it's one of the languages that support it, you can run it on Azure Functions. The whole idea is to give you the flexibility. Because normally like, it's very common that you have a one bad script running on one server that does every five minutes we are doing this process. How many has bad scripts running on the servers? How many love them? How many monitors them properly? Yes. So instead of running them on servers that nobody knows where they are, are they running, what's the status, you can have them on Azure, fun uh, Azure Functions. You can also put your Power Source scripts there, which makes it really, really powerful. Uh, and the whole idea is that I can have, let's say, 20 functions. Five of them might be Power Source scripts. Five of them might be, might be command line scripts. One of them might be PHP. Three of them might be .NET. And then I might have a node. So the whole idea is like whatever is good for your current task, please use that one. Don't, don't think that you're limited to something uh, because you normally do it that way. Then about what makes Azure Functions also good is not only the platform itself, it's also the pricing model. So there's two separate pricing models. Um, one is dedicated, one is dynamic. With dynamic, the whole idea is that as much as you do processing, that's as much as you pay. You don't pay for listening. Let's say that you have a code that gets, gets run, like let's say, every one hour. If you normally run it as a VM, that means that uh, either you need to always shut it down and start it up by every hour, which is a pain in the ass because like, it might come up, it might not go down, there might be issues. Instead, you're just running it every hour and you're only paying for the time that it's running. You're not paying for the time that it's waiting there, as long as you're in dynamic plan. Uh, if you go for dedicated, then it's the same as Azure websites. It's always on, it's always getting, uh, getting built, so there will be cost all the time. Of course, with the same thing as like when you're in dynamic, um, it's very easy to scale it. When you're dedicated, you're responsible for the scaling. So it's more like, do you want to be responsible for the scaling? Or do you want the platform to be responsible for the scaling? 
Uh, one of the great things is that it's completely open source from day one. Before the whole product was announced, uh, it was available on GitHub, which is kind of like a very strange way of Microsoft doing it. Like, if you were browsing GitHub, you could certainly find the repo, and everybody's like, so what is this repo doing? Like, like this has lots of nice stuff and lots of nice documentation, but this doesn't really exist yet. So it has been there for a long, long time. Um, and the interesting thing is like, if you currently see a problem there, you can go and file an issue. Uh, last time I checked was, I think, last uh, this week's Monday. There was a little bit over 100 issues open. Yesterday when I checked, there was only 96 anymore open. So there is more issues, and there is lots of issues closed. So it's constantly evolving. And you can affect its evolution. Like you can seriously go there, file an issue, and probably within a few days, someone from Azure Functions engineering team will say, like, that's a great idea. We will do it next week. And then next week you have a new version and it's fixed. Amazing. Uh, of course, if you don't want to wait, you can just go and fix it yourself and send a pull request and they will probably accept it if they like it. First do an issue and talk with them and then do pull request. Then they will probably accept it and be really, really happy. Then it's very, very simple and flexible. How many have seen the online code editor before this? Nice. How many likes online code editors? Only a few people. Uh, personally, I think that if Notepad is something that you should avoid of writing code with, online editors is somewhere like way, way below. Because like, oh, my session timed out. I lost one hour of coding. Amazing experience. Or like, oh, the saving didn't work. Yay. Um, but at the same time, when I'm doing a small change, uh, which you should never do, of course, but if you're doing a small change in a production very, very quickly, it's a very, very nice tool. Uh, never in production, of course, but you know, sometimes you might have to do adjustments. Um, and I will be showing it. Then the whole idea of serverless. I find this very interesting because the panel yesterday was like, serverless is bad, serverless is evil, there is no way that anything fits there. I totally disagree. I think serverless is something, I, I, totally like, I kind of agree with that, that serverless is a totally new, new thing. There is nothing existing, there is no like serverless best practices from 2008. This is how we have done serverless for 20 years, like no. You will never find that, hopefully, because serverless will be replaced by some new password in a five years or in a few five months. You never know. There is always new passwords. There is always new things. But serverless fits few scenarios really well. One of them is this. I want to run my nice barbers script every one hour. If you currently put it on your web app and you, you, you time it, what happens if you run a new deployment just at that one hour point. The script will probably not run if it's on web app. If you're at just that moment, let's say that you have a timer that every time you deploy, you start one hour timer, you deploy a new version, your timer is off. You will probably miss just that kind of stuff. Oh, you make a revert, then your timer is again off. So whatever you do, like timers are pretty hard if they are not a standalone. So, I really like the scenario that I let the Microsoft Azure take care of my timer. I only need to say like, hey, every hour I want you to call me and then I want to do my stuff myself. Uh, and I like that abstraction level a lot. Uh, then another thing is like, I want to do some data transformation. You're sending me data, I need to talk to that system, but you know, they don't talk to themselves easily. They need something between. Serverless for that, amazing experience. There is no states, there is no SQL databases, there is no database, there is just a little bit of data transformation. Amazing for that. Uh, so, no servers, no nothing that you need to manage, you just put your code there and you say, code, please work for me. And the code works really, really well for you. Of course, if you write bad code, the bad code doesn't come good code because of the platform. So. You still need to write good code, but it's very easy to host it. Uh, then the pricing and the whole scaling thing is very interesting. Depending on your workload, that you can scale it insanely and very, very fast, might be amazing. It might be like, that's the best thing I've ever had. 
for most people, it's like, I couldn't care less. Like, I know what is my, my, my throughput. Like, I know that on Monday I have, like, 1,000 people coming. On Monday evening it's 5,000 people. On Tuesday it's 10,000 people. You normally know the range of people. But especially if we're talking about, like, data transformation, it's more like, I know the data is coming, but I'm not sure how much data is coming. It might be like, like yeah, some kind of data is moving there. And I don't really want to care about like how much data is moving. So that's why in certain scenario that it does the scaling for you, it fits really, really, really well. Then the billing. If I have lots of these functions that do data transformation, if I need to run them constantly and I have a constant load, it totally makes a sense to have a, some kind of like cloud service or service fabric running it. But if I have it like on a burst, like, oh, on Monday I have one million messages, on Tuesday and Wednesday, no messages. On Thursday, because somebody did something, I have again five million messages. Then it makes really sense that you're only paying during the time that you get the load and you can scale it crazily. And you only get paid for very, very little time. If your function is fast, you get paid for like, like few cents, which I think is amazing. Then what are the benefits, like real, real benefits, is the speed. It's very, very easy to get started. It's not like I need to set up my cluster, I need to think about like how many nodes I want, I need to wait for, for like half an hour to all my clusters to, to, to come up, and then I need to join them. I get started in like two minutes, maybe 30 seconds also, something between that. Then the whole thing is it's managed for you. Uh, this is scary, and at the same time, this is awesome. It means that you have no control over the platform. If you want control, this is horrible, because you're like, like there is no way that you can get any control. You need to trust Microsoft. Normally, I would say it's pretty good. But it also helps you that I can focus on the business logic. I don't need to think about anything else. Amazing. But let's go with the demo. So what does the service, uh, what does the Azure Functions look like? So here uh, is my Azure portal. Um, and I have created an Azure function before. Uh, it currently takes around one minute to, for it to come alive, so that's why I've made it already. Uh, my Azure function is called iglu.conf 2017. Uh, when I get started, uh, it will load a nice editor for me. Uh, sometimes if the internet is slow, this might take a while. Let's see, I hope this time the internet is very, very fast. Yay, there we go. And then you can just say, I want to start to create a new function. When you start creating functions, the first thing it asks you, like, hey, what kind of function are you writing? Because normally, like, like oh, I'm, I'm creating something that takes Azure Service Bus, or I'm taking something that takes files in, or I want to do queries, or I just want to do webhooks. So now uh, I know what I want to do. I want to do generic webhook with C Sharp. Then it asks me, what is my name? Then I say, I click on demo. And then I say create. Voila, my function is now up and running. Uh, as soon as my, my URL is generated. So as soon as I, I start creating it, it will take me a sample, uh, like create me a sample code, and then it will create me a URL which I can use to make a call to my website. So by default, it secures it uh, by creating a key that you need to have. You can also say that, hey, I don't want any security. Or you can say that, hey, I want to do Azure AD, or I want to do Twitter, Facebook, whatever, authentications out of the box. And here is my very, very nice response that just uh, answers me uh, that my get method is not allowed on my webhook uh, receiver. It only takes post. Uh, and now my code is nicely here. Um, if you can look like this is a very, very normal C Sharp code. Uh, it starts by saying that, hey, uh, I'm going to use um, NewtonSoft, the JSON package. Then it's like what uh, namespaces I'm using. Then I have a one um, function, basically, which does um, a run 
and and that's it. There is nothing more complex than this. Uh, but let's let's do a little bit of sample. Um, instead of doing this, let's 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 make a real function. So this function takes in Twitter tweets. After that, it knows that the Twitter uh, tweets that I get are in JSON format. Then, because I'm a, I'm a really, really knowledgeable about Twitter now, I know that it has something called user details, and I know that it has something called follower, uh, follower count. So what this happens is when I get tweet in, I look how many followers does that Twitter account has. So if somebody tweets, I will go and look like, hey, that person tweeted how many followers he has. If he has more than 10 followers, I will say like, awesome. If no, I will say no retweet. So this is a logic that I could write that, hey, everybody who tweets about Azure and has more than 100 followers, I think their, their tweets are very valuable and I would retweet them all the time. So this is a very simple data transformation logic. Uh, but how do I then like make this um, happen for real? Uh, we talked about a little bit, like quickly about logic apps. So I made a very uh, simple logic app here. Let me show you. So this is the logic app. Uh, what did I make? So every three minutes, my logic app goes to Twitter. It's been authorized by myself, so it goes with my account, goes to ask for any tweets that has hashtag igluconf. After that, uh, it sends uh, the, whole, the whole tweet into my Azure function. Then we check if the status code is equal to 200, which in our scenario was that if there is more than 10 followers with that person, then we are like, hey, everything is great. Uh, but because like, um, I'm not doing a live demo where I use my Twitter to, to do all kind of crazy stuff, what I do is I call Twilio. How many know what Twilio is? Twilio is one of the world's largest SMS uh, and call portals and tools. So the idea is that if you want to send SMS messages, you want to receive SMS messages, you want to make uh, phone calls that are automated, Twilio is your tool. Uh, if, for example, you ever use Uber uh, as a service, uh, then all the SMS messages that get through Uber, their two-factor authentication and everything is through Twilio. So I call my Twilio function uh, where I send uh, from a Swedish number to my Finnish number, an SMS message where I say like, hey, somebody just tweeted about Iglucon with this name. And then of course my phone starts ringing. So currently I have 12 text messages uh, during one hour, which is really nice. So if you currently go and tweet with hashtag Iglucon, it will send me text message if you have more than 10 followers. So the whole idea is that you can really easily combine a business logic into your app. Um, and, and get started with this. Uh, now let's go back to, to the slides a little bit. So you saw the, the very nice web UI. You saw how I, how I made changes into it. So what's that? There's a few limitations that people are having. Source control. So if I do my edits on the online editor, where is my source control? If I go there and make a change and I break it, how do I go back to the previews? How do I make my changes? How do I make sure that, that if there is more than one guy that we don't make changes and overwrite each other? So that's a limitation currently in that one. Then versioning. If you don't have a source control, it's really, really hard to do the versioning. It, like, 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 there is no way to do it. And then, of course, debugging. The debugging experience. How do you debug something that's on a web editor? So there is lots of discussion that this would be a problem. And I will now then show you, uh, first of all, the Azure functions from Visual Studio. So there is a Visual Studio tooling to create all the Azure functions. So if you are not a very big fan of online editors, like I'm not, uh, then you can use Visual Studio. You have your very familiar environment. You have your IntelliSense. You have all the goodies, and you can just then deploy it to the Azure functions. Uh, but before we go to the Azure functions on Visual Studio, I want to show you a little bit more uh, on like debugging. 
because debugging is is they have like thought about that like i mean i mean the people who make azure functions i would say that they have few times at least thought about making uh making things interesting so on the left side hand side uh, where it says develop integrate manage and monitor the interesting thing is that uh the monitor one the monitor one monitors your function out of the box so you cannot i think i think you even cannot turn it off so it always monitors your functions and then records when was it called what was the input what was the output so every time that somebody calls your your function it's monitored so this is one of the things is that you don't need to write the monitoring code if you don't want because the platform takes care of it for you of course now the problem is that if you currently have a, some tool set that you're like I totally want to use this tool set. Uh, then this might be an issue for you. Let's take that one. So yeah. So if you have a tool set that you want to use always, uh, then the issue might be that you need to use this one. So at here, uh, we can see that uh, my nice function was called. And then we can see that uh, I have 10 errors on my code. Uh, this was because I tested this a lot. Uh, so my, when I was testing, I didn't like I did changes that break it. But currently, it's working really well, and I see all my log. So whenever you write log during your function, you can see it here, um, and then you can like start looking at it um, easier. But now, um, if you ever have problems, that's a very good place to start. Here is my Visual Studio project. So first of all, you need to install Azure SDK and Azure Functions tooling. Um, and after that, you will get a very nice, um, very nice looking, uh, looking project that is very, very different from your normal CSR project. So in a normal CSR project, you have something called like your project.cs pro uh, file, which contains all the references. And then you have your old code there, your classes there, your NuGet packages and everything. Here's a little bit different that we have folders. Each folder represents one function. So in this sample, I have one function called tweet processing. Uh, then I have function.json file, uh, which basically defines uh, how, like, first of all, is my function disabled? What kind of input do I take? And what kind of output do I give? All right. Uh, then what I have is my run.csx file, which is my really nice C sharp code. Of course, C sharp code is always, always really, really nice. Uh, so this tells you like, like what, do, what do I have here? And then I have my sample.dat. So the idea is that when you write your, your functions, uh, you can store like this is my sample data. So in the future, if somebody else goes make changes to my function, they can just take the data from sample.dat file and start using it. Uh, so what can I do with Visual Studio? I can always say start. If I start my Visual Studio, it will start a local instance of Azure Functions. Uh, the tooling is very much in a preview. Uh, so if you have any issues with it, uh, just go to the GitHub repo and raise an issue, and they will try to fix it. Uh, they are currently releasing about monthly a new version uh, about the tooling. But now my Azure function is running locally uh, on local host, and I can start calling it. And I start, can start testing it on my local machine, so I don't need to deploy it. Then when we are talking about deploying, uh, if I want to deploy my project, I can just right click my project and say publish. Uh, after that, I just need to say, hey, I want to use uh, my, my Azure function. And then you can just say publish a nice project now. It's there right away. It takes about 20 seconds to, to one minute uh, to publish, depending, depending a lot on your, your connection, connection to the server on how it goes. So now we have gone a little bit of that. Uh, one of the things is that your function might need to be a little bit more smarter. Because on, on like on our scenario, it was like six lines of code. There was no intelligence when you do it on, on an online. But when you use Visual Studio, you can start doing a little bit more like advanced things. Let me zoom a little bit so we can see. So here, the first thing that I do is I all the data. Uh, I know it's JSON, and I happen to know 
what kind of data uh, I'm getting. So how do I know this? How many know bait about JSON to C sharp? I think this is one of the best things. So what you do with this is that I know that my sample tweet looks like this. I just take my JSON and then I click generate. What it does is that it generates C-sharp classes based on JSON. Because like one of the things that I really don't like is remembering by heart what kind of data structure I am using. I want to use classes. I want IntelliSense. So I always use JSON to C-sharp to turn this into classes. So now at here, I have my public class, uh, root object, my public class user details, and my public uh, like class user mention, which has all the functions, like all the fields. So it tells me what kind of fields I had on my JSON, and now it's very easier to write the code. So now when I go and say like, hey, when I get the JSON back, instead of making a dynamic object, I'm telling like, hey, this is a type of a root object. And then my Visual Studio knows, oh, so if this is a root object, then you can say data, and then it knows automatically like, hey, you have uh, user details here, or user mentions, so user details. And then you can choose like followers count, more than 10. Uh, so it gives you very nice intelligence experience, and then you can start doing it like way, way more nicer code. But what's an issue here? The nice function that was seven lines of code before is now, what it's what 68 67 lines of code so now all of your classes starts to be here and that might be an issue because now like like whenever you start adding more complex data the amount of code is starting to grow and grow and grow and grow and more and then it's like more like so how do i share this let's say that i have seven functions that do something with tweet tweets I have seven different functions. One of them checks uh, followers, one of them does something else, one of them does something else. If I want to use the same models on all of those, now I would need to copy paste my code into all of those functions. And that's not like, like copy paste coding. How many does copy paste coding now and then? A lot of people, how many like it? I hate it. Yes, yes, it's, it's very nice to get started with like copy pasting a sample and then, then started with that. But when you need to start like always going back to your project, copying your models and moving it there, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. No, 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 I mean, I mean I'm not going to do this. So, so that's one of the things is that after you have reached the point that you start to have models on your Azure functions, then we are, and you have multiple, like if you have only like once used the model, then it's like, okay, I can totally put my models there and we are totally fine. But when you start to doing, using those models a lot, then we're going to get uh, into a little bit of issue. NuGet, how many use NuGet packages? Shame on you if you don't use NuGet packages. I certainly don't know how you, like if you're today doing a new project from Visual Studio, I think by default it has two to three NuGet packages. I think ASP.NET Core has like 12 NuGet packages right from start. Like seriously, ASP.NET Core doesn't work without NuGet packages. There is nothing before the NuGet packages. So why are we using NuGet packages? How many has created their own NuGet package? How many think it was really, really hard? Nobody. How many think it's really easy? I think it was seriously really easy. Uh, the problem is that not that many people create the packages. Everybody thinks that creating a NuGet package is some kind of dark magic and it's not for our company, it's only for big enterprises like Microsoft and I don't know, huge companies like that. No, it's not. The whole idea of NuGet is basically to share your DLL files or in this case your compiled classes. Sharing a code. Sharing code might be inside of your own organization, it might be sharing with everybody in my team, or it might be sharing with globally everybody. Another big thing is versioning. Let's say that my Twitter data model is, is, is now really, really good. If I want to do changes on it, let's say I change uh, Twitter data models, like there's a new, new field in a Twitter JSON. If I have eight functions, now I would need to go to all the eight functions, 
update the models, and most probably I would do a mistake. If you go to eight different functions and do, do a change there, I would probably do a mistake. I would copy paste it wrongly or, or broke something, and then I would have, a, have lots of problems. So NuGet is really good for that. I was wondering, versioning. How many has done more than one version of a code library that you have been sharing with your company? I think it's very common. If you are sharing your code, there will be more than one version. If there's only one version, I'm like, I'm really, really surprised. Because that's probably mean that that project was like one shot off and then like nothing changed in the two years. If we look at the world today, it's more like if nothing changes in a one week, I'm really happy. Like seriously, if, if nothing changes on Azure, like if Azure UI looks same the next month, I get a little bit scared. It has never looked same for one month, which I think I kind of like and hate at the same time. So versioning, another thing, release notes. When I release a new version of my package, I can tell everybody like, hey, I just added these new awesome features. And then everybody's like, oh, nice. I was just looking for that feature. Now I can update my NuGet package and I get that feature. So it gives all of that power straight from, from the NuGet itself. So how do we create the NuGet package? You create the normal C Sharp uh, library project. Very simple, looks same as everything else. You create this hugely hard new spec file. It's a XML file with, I think, 12 lines of code. We will look at next. After that, you run one PowerShell command. Then something happens, and you profit with the NuGet package creation. So NuGet spec file. This is a real NuGet spec file. You can use this to publish. So what does it have? It has ID. So when you're doing uh, nuket.install newtonsoft.json, that's the ID of the JSON packet. It's newtonsoft.json. So you can rename it like my company dot models or my company dot secret functions or whatever you want to name it. It just needs to be unique um, in the server. Then the next thing is that you're saying what is the version number. You can have like 1.0.0.0 or 1. Point whatever. You can add beta there, um, but normally like as many numbers as you want, you can do the versioning. NuGet doesn't really care that much. Then it will ask you what is the title. So when you're searching on, on Visual Studio, this is the title that you see on Visual Studio. Then it asks who are the authors. So who has contributed to this NuGet package? Who has made this possible? Uh, then it asks, who's the owner? Because it might be that uh, we have six guys in our company who has contributed to this project, but the owner is our company. So this is more like about that. So who can manage my package? Um, after that, it will ask you, do we need a license acceptance? So I can say that everybody who uses my NuGet package, they need to accept my licenses. And I can have like huge long license. How many has seen NuGet packages that require license? Most of the Microsoft packages do. Most people click I accept without reading anything. Uh, I have never read the whole documentation. I think it's somewhere like 700 lines of text and it's huge wall. Uh, but yeah, still, you can still require them to accept it. Uh, but most people will just click accept. Then you can describe your package so people understand when they find it. Um, and this package is live, so you can, you can see it. And then I have my nice release notes, which in this case is just ship it. Nothing more, very, very simple. Then I can define tags and these kind of things. So what is the real, like when you create the package, what does it look like? So you open PowerShell or see a command line tool, whichever you prefer. I prefer PowerShell way more. First, you say uh, NuGet set API key. So this is your API key. This is how you authenticate. Uh, for some reason, I'm not showing my API key. I wonder why. Then you say, package my project. And the next thing is like, publish it. So it certainly takes you to go to nuket.org, register account, get key, then three lines of PowerShell, and your package is now in NuGet. Sounds really hard, right? Super hard. All right. So I'm going to show you my nice NuGet package project. Uh, let's go there. So here uh, I have my ICLU-Conf models. 
and let's make it now, so it's version 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, let's make it 1.2, uh, just to make it nice. Uh, and here is my, my nice Twitter models. So I have nothing else than copy pasted them here. I have nothing else here except my models, just to make sure that everybody using the same models. And then I can just like uh, update it. Uh, then I have a PowerShell script. My insanely hard PowerShell script. So let's save it. So what I do is I say NuGet, package my project, and then I'm saying NuGet, publish my project. Um, of course, I've run the, um, run the set API key on my computer before, so I don't need to do it anymore. Then I'm going to say, say NuGet, run my nice project. So now it will go first, it made a package, and now it's uploading the whole package to NuGet. Uh, and now my package, new version of it, is available at nuket.org. After you have published your package, it takes around one minute to one and a half minutes to see it at nuket.org. If you're interested, of like, like how do you know where your nuket packages are, the best way is to go to nuket.org. Uh, you know your, your package name. You can just search for it. Uh, here, we can see that it's telling me, because like I'm currently logged in, it will tell you that this package has not been indexed yet. So it means that if you go search it currently on Visual Studio, you might not find it at the moment. But if you wait for, let's say, three to four minutes, uh, then it will be available there. Now you can see that I have nicely, nicely published three different versions. And for some reason, my package is very popular and it has zero downloads. Let's, let's fix that. So now, uh, I go back to, my, uh, back to my, my project. Instead of having my, my models here, I will just say like, hey, I don't need my models here. Then I will go to project.json. How many has used project.json file? How many has seen it? So before there was something called package just JSON, and then they changed to the project to JSON, and now they're changing again. Currently, I have no idea what's the new format going to be. Uh, I think it's called going to be the package to JSON or something mixed between them. And the funny thing is, I think nobody currently knows. Uh, so they have been changing this quite a while. But currently, Azure Functions uses uh, packages to JSON. Uh, the thing is that the current tooling. Uh, when you're doing Azure Functions, doesn't have this nice UI where you can say like, "Hey, I want to see my my fun like uh, NuGet packages." Like here, you can say like, "Manage NuGet packages." Then you have a nice search where you can just write ekluconf, and then you have my nice NuGet package. So the problem is currently Azure Function doesn't have this nice UI framework. Instead, you just go to a file and write it yourself. After that. Uh, the only thing that you need to do uh, is then add that, hey, I'm using that, that, uh, that different namespace. So the thing is that uh, the first thing that we see on the top of, the, top of my functions is something called R. It means require newtonsoft.json. Newtonsoft.json is pre-installed on Azure Functions. Everything else, if you're using them, needs to be on project.json. After they are in project.json, then you need to go and say, hey, I'm using, and then whatever you're using. The problem here is that by default, because whereas as I'm saying, the tooling is in preview. The tooling doesn't understand by default that, hey, even though we have the NuGet package, we are not yet referencing it, so you need to manually go and add the using statements. How many have used uh, written using statements manually? Resharper does it for me normally. I'm really bad at writing them manually. Uh, so it's just something that if your code doesn't compile, the first thing to check on functions like, are my using statements correct? Just from experience. Might have been a few problems with that. So now my code is very nice. My function is very clear. So what? I have like 10 lines of code here. My models are nice. I still have all the intelligence and everything. And now I can just go and publish this function. 
um, into Azure functions, I will nicely use my NuGet package. After you have published your, your thingy, uh, the Azure function is the first thing it does, like when it gets a new version, it checks like, hey, has my project.json file been updated? If it has been updated, the first thing it does, like, hey, let's download all the project.json files that we have there, and, and let's get started with that. But now, of course, uh, with NuGet packages, there is one issue that lots of people see. How many has uh, private NuGet packages? So one of the most common things is that, okay, I have NuGet packages, but I don't want to share them with the whole world. My NuGet packages contains my very secret models. Uh, because they're very, they're, they might be like sensitive functions, there might be API keys, there might be something that is like, we don't want to share that with anybody. We don't want to tell the world that what we're building. So that's why we are talking about then private NuGet packages. Before, one of the ways to do the private NuGet packages was that you download the NuGet server binaries, and then you start hosting it yourself. Who has hosted NuGet servers? Few guys. Uh, personally, I hate hosting stuff. I'm really, really bad at hosting things. Uh, if there is something that I'm hosting myself and I don't have monitoring it, it might take me like a month to notice that, oops, it was down. That's why I don't host NuGet servers myself. Like, I'm like, I would be really, really bad at that. Because it doesn't have a monitoring tool built in that would email me and tell me, hey, go and check it out, it's down. So what I do instead is that um, I buy my NuGet server for free as a service. So these guys at MyGet, uh, Martin, who speaks here to me yesterday, is one of the founders. So they do the hosting for me. I currently have, uh, I've used their service in, in five different projects. We have been really happy with that. You get started for free, um, and then, it, then it's like when you want to do private, you need to pay like a small amount of money then monthly, and they're really doing it care for you. Uh, and when you do that, then you can say like, hey, Instead of getting the NuGet packages from the public repository, you just say, like, my NuGet packages are not coming from the public one. My NuGet packages are coming from that direction. I want them from there. Here is my super secret key so that I can access them. Uh, there is samples, like, uh, there is very much like samples provided by Microsoft which explains you how to do this private private field um, on a MyGet and I was like how to do it on your own hosted NuGet field. So the whole idea is that NuGet doesn't need to be public. It totally can be, can be without being public. So then, let's go a little bit back. Why Azure Functions? It's still the same reasons. It's super, super easy to get started. It's super flexible. I mean, interesting things like, like I didn't spend that much time writing my code. Of course, like if the code is complex, it's not going to become any easier. Like if you have a complex function and you put it on Azure function, it's not going to become simpler. So don't try to fit like insanely huge things on Azure functions. For example, if your code execution takes more than, let's say, five to 10 minutes, I would not recommend Azure functions. Because Azure function is not meant for that. Azure function is meant for small things, very stateless, without dependencies. Of course, like, um, if you're running, let's say, one, every one hour, you can do like a SQL query, you can do database administration, like I clean up my tables, or I pour my cache, or I create my cache, or that kind of things. But if you want something that gets called randomly within a load, don't have any dependencies then it works great, then it scales, then it doesn't matter that your database might not scale automatically, it matters that your function scales and your function will work because it doesn't have any dependency. So if you ever get into the workload that you're like, there is no guidance how to do this certain workload on Azure functions, most probably, if it seems really, really hard to do it, they're probably putting something on Azure functions that's not supposed to be there. So Azure Function is not like silver bullet that solves all the world problems and makes us all rich and famous. No. Azure Function is there to solve small problems very quickly and very fast and being very, very reliable and scaling well. Nothing else, but nothing less. Then a few words about tooling. 
the tooling is in preview. The tooling is improving. How many has a new Visual Studio 2017? I'm still very scared. I have not yet installed it on my main machine. I'm still running Visual Studio 2015. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, once 2017 has been out there, I think all of the tooling will very quickly move to 2017. But the nice thing is that there is a completely new way of writing tooling on 2017. Hooray! Uh, so all the tooling will need to be made again. Uh, so that's why the tooling is a little bit lacking behind now. And that's why lots of Azure tooling is in a preview state. So hopefully we will very, very quickly see very, very nice tooling. Another thing is like on the Azure Functions, uh, when you're calling Azure Functions from Logic Apps, it's currently pretty easy, uh, but when you return the output to your, to your uh, Azure Logic App, that's not yet uh, completely super, super easy, but they have been telling like, hey, if you're working on this, probably next month, everything will be better. And that's one of the key things is that if you currently start using Azure Functions, uh, if you face problems, I would be like, okay, great. Use something else. Then come back in two to three months, and uh, probably your problems have been solved. If you think that you have somehow unique problem that has nobody else has faced, uh, go to GitHub, file an issue, and then it will be fixed. Or at least somebody will answer that, hey, no, I don't think we will fix this. I think we're totally fine of having this issue, because we are thinking that you're alone with this problem. There is nobody else with this issue. Then NuGet packages. Please, 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 start creating NuGet packages. How many has a project that has, like, how many, has a, how many people have a solution that has lots of projects? Oh, lots of people. Why you don't have them as a NuGet packages? NuGet allows you total same debugging experience. It allows you to version them. It allows you to decouple them so that some people can be making changes to that project while they're not making, while you're making changes to this project. It allows you so, so many things. And like I showed you, it's very, very simple. Uh, if you have a team city, uh, you're using TFS, you're using any kind of automated uh, building tools, they already have these two functions. One of them is create NuGet package, and the second one is publish a NuGet package. So they are ready made for that. Uh, they have the steps, just get using it. And if you want private, go for MyGet. If you don't want private, go for NuGet.org. Uh, it's a very, very powerful way, works really well, both for clients, servers, web, whatever development you're making. Of course, some people are saying that, uh, no, we don't have internet connection, so we cannot do this. All right? If you don't have internet connection, you cannot use NuGet.org. How many are coding without internet connection? All right, few. Uh, it's very, very rare that you're coding all the time without internet connection. Sometimes you might be without internet connection, but at least I'm really lost without documentation. And I haven't seen local documentation, at least like that was I think four or five years ago before when I saw a local documentation in a PDF. Of course, you can download most of the documentation in PDF, but at least I'm searching all the time. So I don't see that as a huge issue myself. Then uh, NuGet functions, uh, sorry, Azure functions plus NuGet packages is a really, really good match. You can keep them simple, you can update your NuGet packages, and you can like make them really, really well and really, really quickly. At this point, questions about Azure functions or NuGet packages? Yes? Can you set a spending limit on a function? If you make a mistake and <coughs> Infinite loop in your function doesn't mean that you will go bankrupt. Or so, if your other stuff invokes the function like mistakenly every millisecond. So, so can you send a spending limit on Azure functions? No. That's a kind of a. There is an issue about that. Uh, I think they're they're currently saying that uh, I don't remember what's the timeline, but they're working on adding a spending limit. Uh, if you have an Azure function that's getting hit all the time for I think one week. And if you have set your auto scaling to like insane amount, uh, which is like kind of limited, uh, I think it will cost you, I think thousand euros a week max. And that's like, we're talking about like, somebody's like, you're doing millions of millions of requests. But you can always go to the auto scale and start like, like 
like make it down. So when you're doing development, don't set auto scale to infinite. Set, set it a little bit smaller, so then you can get started with it, and there is no like issue issue in that sense. Uh, if you have a normal, like you don't have the auto scale set that much, uh, you can totally like you cannot get that huge bill. It's as a as maximum like uh, if you think like dedicated offering. If you have an Azure Web Pass as a premium, that's I think 100 euros a month. So to read 100 euros a month with Azure Functions is already like, if you can do that um, with, with, without the auto scale, um, that will take you months. Yes, so uh, also to add to that, so the dynamic plan does not have this kind of uh, um, yeah, limit, limit, but uh, if you put it, if you really want to manage the cost, you actually yeah, so if you want to manage the cost, you can do a dedicated plan, and then you have like one monthly fee. There is no variation between it. Um, it's exactly the same as the Azure uh, app service, app, serv app service environment. So that's that's limited. You get the dedicated farms. It's it doesn't scale infinitely. It scales as much as you want it, want it to scale. But of course, then you don't get the benefits of serverless because you're actually literally managing a server farm there. Yeah. I have never seen, like, there's lots of things on Azure that people use on Autoscale. scale. Uh, I have never seen anybody really um, doing this, except, like, my get guys, like, dosing themselves. Uh, but you should have a tooling to, to monitor it. Um, like, on Azure Functions, if your Azure Function is doing something, uh, you should have a monitor that monitors it. So automatically, it does some monitoring. So if it starts to loop all over again, then the Azure functions will um, will will like cancel itself. So if you go infinite loop inside of your Azure functions, if something else that you're doing is going to infinite loop and calling Azure functions, the thing that's calling should have some kind of mechanism to to shut it down itself. For example, if you do logic app that loops forever, the logic app shuts it down itself in a few minutes. So. Dosing yourself without custom code is really hard. Dosing yourself with custom code might be pretty easy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, my question was in terms of like if you have a test and production tenant, and now we're publishing the Azure Function from Visual Studio, is there a way to publish the code also to the test function app and then production function app so that you can test the like, Azure Function against the test? Yeah. So we were asking, like, uh, can we publish the Azure Functions first to the test environment and then the production environment? So Azure Functions is completely supported with uh, VSTS, so Visual Studio Team Services. So you can build a process that whenever I make a change, uh, all my changes go to dev environment. When somebody makes a new, like, uh, like when somebody goes there and say, like, hey, now we want this to pilot environment, then it goes to pilot environment. And when somebody goes and say, like, oh, everything is working great, then it can go to product environment. The same way as Azure Web Apps. So if you have built your pipeline for Azure Web Apps, uh, you can get the whole same tooling to, to Azure Functions. So in this case, it goes to the function app, which is the production function app, and then the Yes, uh, I, I would I would separate them so you have a different function app for production, different one for development, and different one for for testing and that kind of purposes. And route it from VSDS to yes, so you do the routing to VSDS. So the tooling is like if you have ever built something for web app, uh, all the same stuff works for for Azure functions. So that's why it's it's pretty powerful. Uh, Thank you for all the sponsors, and if you have any questions, I will be here whole day, so please grab me and, and let's talk. All right. Thanks, Daimo. So let's have a coffee break. Yes. So we have uh, five minutes.